Good afternoon, my name is Justin. Welcome to my channel. I play guitar on Songs in Nashville, and today I've got another song from a subscriber who wanted some feedback. I'm going to read you his email right here. Hey Justin, hope you're good. I love your YouTube channel, which is where I got this email address. Hopefully that's not weird. Of course not. I put it there so people could find it. I'm a songwriter based in Austin, and I've been thinking about trying to do something with my songs. You clearly know your way around the business, so I'm wondering if you ever do consulting work for people like me. Yep. I'm basically trying to find out if these songs are actually any good and what my options are. I'm older, I've got a kid, I don't really want to do the touring thing, but it'd be awesome if I could do something with all these songs. Anyway, let me know, and thanks so much for your channel. It's truly been an eye-opener for me. So, he sent me a song. I don't know what this sounds like. We're going to find out. This could be terrible. <laughs> um, it could be really great too. And uh, regardless of how it comes out, I'm not here to criticize or make fun or put anybody down. Um, I'm here to constructively criticize, give criticism that is helpful and pointers that are helpful. So uh, on these videos, I typically write a chart as I listen. And it's very rare that I have to stop the song to figure out what a chord is. Uh, at least in pop music, you know. Um, and I also usually play with a guitar in hand. So I'm going to play with my Jazz Master here, my Danocaster. And uh, this is what it sounds like. So, um... I guess I got a little bit of slap back on, and I also have the throwback overdrive boost, so I'm going to at least turn the slap back off. Cool. So, here we go. Uh, I already dumped his song into Pro Tools. I thought it would be easier to start and stop the song um, in Pro Tools rather than in Finder on my Mac, you know. So. Uh, his name's W.B. Jacobs, and there'll be a link to uh, some of his music if you want to check it out afterward. Let's go. Our 
second chorus. God, here. it's cutting me down, and we can hop the river, and it'd be much faster. We can say so long to this whole disaster. second chorus, I think of that as a solo. And this was long. Outro. Yeah, we're toward the end of the file. Have a long outro. Very cool. So it sounds like um, he's capoed way up here on the acoustic. So um, a few thoughts right off the bat. We've got an acoustic an electric guitar that's just lightly strumming that's tucked way back, and then a vocal. We've got a four-bar intro, an eight-bar verse, eight-bar chorus, four-bar turn, and then we have verse, chorus, solo, chorus, out, and those are all eight-bar sections. So here's the chart. Now, um, this feels kind of more like a work tape. Like, it's very melancholy. It's about a corduroy road. And he actually explained to me what that is in the email um, when he sent me the song. Uh, it's a road made by lining up logs um, perpendicular to the path, so they're going across. And it, it was a way for people to get through really marshy, swampy areas more easily. I think it was used a lot in, in wartime for soldiers when they're marching. You know, it, it was in America during the Civil War. Uh, they did it in Europe as well. I guess sometimes they would lay these logs in really peat bog-ish areas, and that would be a foundation for a road. And because the logs were in a peat bog, they wouldn't decay very quickly, if at all. <laughs> so anyway, corduroy road, very rough terrain, right? And the whole the whole lyric is this sort of melancholy, like, I want to be done with this. I want to be over it. And so maybe if he's referring to being a younger person during a war that he's just sick of all the death and this endless road. Like, the war is never going to end, right? So, um, my first thought is that it could speed up a little bit. It's a little, it's a little slow, and I know that leads to the melancholy vibe, but there, there is a faster tempo in there that doesn't take away from the vibe of the lyric. You know, it's not like we want to make it fast and make it a rock song, but it could come up a couple clicks just to move a little better without losing the the sort of weightiness of the lyric. The turnaround is just so long for not being a solo. It's it's forever. It's four bars. 
it could be just uh, a full bar of six minor. And then half a bar of four. Half a bar of four, half a bar of five, and get right into the next verse. So this, this song, this track feels more like a work tape to me, where it's just basically getting the form down so that we have the lyric, we have a shape of the song, something recorded so we don't forget. I work with a lot of work tapes in Nashville. Session players build entire tracks from just a work tape with a little bit of direction from a producer, right? And on this, on this work tape, this feels like a work tape song. I'm sorry if it, I'm not trying to offend you, but just it's, it's an acoustic, it's a tiny bit of an electric. They're both be, being very foundational. There's not a ton of movement. There's not a ton of attention. Your, sh your attention doesn't really shift to what's happening. It's very background. And then there's lyric, right? So I think of that as more of a work tape. There's an entire career <laughs> in Nashville that some people have at labels and at publishing companies where they listen to work tapes. They listen to songs and try to match them to artists. And so when we cut demos in Nashville, what we're trying to do is match that song to an artist. And we're trying to convey everything we want to convey in the song, but do it in a way that keeps attention. Like if there's a really long, slow intro, and our people are like, next, <laughs> like they're just going to move on. And so we're, we're really conscious of all the sections of the song and the shape of the song, you know? So it, it might be cool to have your four bar intro. I could see that. Um, and since we're in D, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I always do on kind of, not always, but often I'll just tune down to drop D and kind of fake sort of a baritone thing. So I would I would have something in the intro like your your acoustic pattern could even have a melody in it you know you could uh And then just back to simple strumming when the lyric comes in for the verse That could be cool and, um, you know, from, from verse two out, uh, verse two, the end of verse two, that's our last new lyrical information, right? You've basically written a verse, a chorus, and another verse. And then you go back to two more choruses with some instrumental stuff. So I feel like there could be room for more lyrical content, to be honest with you. Instead of a giant eight bar solo, after chorus two and before chorus three, like that could be, that could be a bridge, you know, that could go somewhere else in terms of the chords, the harmonic structure, and you could have a, a bridge that adds some new dimension to what your lyric is about. It's about this road that you're ready to get off of, right? And you could attack that same idea from a different angle or bring a new element that brings some sort of conflict to it, right? I, I, I don't know, I'm just tossing ideas out, but after your, your second chorus, you could build into a bridge. chorus is down.
you know, and then the back half of the chorus is up. And then your outro, which is kind of long, to be honest, um, that could be the instrumental thing. Like it's a sort of a jam out. This the song and the vibe reminds me of like early Ryan Adams or Whiskey Town. You know, that's just sort of the the vibe of it that I get. Some of the some of the darker, more melancholy stuff that he did early on. Yeah, I would I would tighten sections up. I would you know that turnaround only really needs to be two bars. Three, four, one, two. top of the second verse and then again there's just there's not a whole lot of lyric you've got verse chorus second verse and then it's just the same chorus twice in a row and there's no more new information so um it feels like i i feel like i want more lyric out of it i want a bridge that explores this concept in a deeper way or provides some sort of contrast lyrically you know just just something to take it to a different place. And you mentioned wanting to do something with all your songs. You don't want to go on tour. You don't want to be an artist. You've got a family and all that. And I totally get that. You know, I got off the road. I don't want to be on the road anymore either. Um, so to me, the, the other option is to keep writing songs and get other people to cut them and other people to tour singing your songs and stuff like that. And I will say that that's really difficult. Um, it's it's as hard as being a session player. Well, yeah, yeah, it probably is. You know, it's a very small, exclusive community of people in town, and they've all had this really long, difficult road of getting to the point where they're so good at writing songs and writing songs that other people want to hear and songs that other people want to sing that a publishing company has said, hey, we'll pay you a retainer you know, or a draw is what they call it. And in exchange for this draw, it's usually, it's usually pretty meager, like, I don't know, 30, 50 grand, maybe something like that. Um, we'll pay you that. So you're being paid to set aside time to write. And we're going to put you in rooms with other writers, with artists, uh, with writers at our publishing company, with writers at other publishing companies. We're going to try to find that right combination of creativity that, that, you know, you, you end up writing something that gets cut by an artist and makes money on the radio. Um, people think radio is largely irrelevant now. It still is a big deal when you ring the bell, when you have a song that goes number one. It still is a um, sizable payday for all the writers, you know. And depending on the deal that you have with your publishing company, you split uh, those royalties in some way, you know. I think that's hard. I think that's hard to do but it's not impossible. And if that's the angle that you're going, I think having the form of your songs set in such a way that it's not, it just, it doesn't just camp out on one thing for too long. Like a, just a guitar strumming is gonna lose people's attention. Other artists that might wanna cut your songs, an A&R person, a publishing, publishing company, you know. So it would make sense to me to get like three or four of your songs that you feel the most strongly about. Obviously, you really like this one. I think it's cool. It's got a really great concept. I just want a little more lyric. I want a change after chorus two and some new information, lyrically and harmonically and even melodically, you know, all, all the way across. But get, get some really good sounding demos cut of your songs. And then use that to start shopping yourself around as a writer. Like, hey, I, I've written these songs. This is what I offer. Does anybody want to co-write? You know? <laughs> and, I, I mean, there are a ton of published writers in town. There are a lot more non-published independent writers in town who are doing everything themselves, you know? It, today, is, it's easier to do to do things on your own than it ever has been. I, I think that could be a logical next step for you is, is to get some really good recordings of your songs and uh, use them as a business card. It's very common. People do it all the time. And you know, you're based in Austin and there are studios there and there are a lot of great players there. You know, it's it, they've got their own, Texas has its own session scene that is wildly different from Nashville, wildly different. Uh, I learned this when I went out to 
Texas recently to cut an, a record with Aaron Watson. We went to Rosewood Studios in Tyler. And half the band came down from Nashville and half the band was Texas players. And I got to be good friends with a couple of the Texas guys and we got to talking about what our work lives look like. And it is so wildly different. I think that'd be a really cool episode on the channel actually, is if I could get get one of those guys up here and do like an interview and just talk about you know, how different it is being a session player in Texas versus, you know, being one in Nashville. So, you know, you could do those there. You could do those here, your demos. But I think that's I think that's something that that could be really cool. Uh, I want to do one thing for you. I want to play through this song as if it were on a session. So. <laughs> Here we go. Let's see. Let's just see what happens. I'll just play along and, and you know.
So, you know, um, I'm trying to use one guitar track to add a bunch of dynamics. You'll notice in the, in the first verse and chorus, I completely forgot that I had tuned my low string down and, and was planning on doing sort of a baritone-ish thing, but I, I went there later on in the song. My, my default, my instinct on this kind of song is to do something in the baritone world, and if there's a steel player, something higher that doesn't slide around, but if there's not a steel player, then I would do something with a slide and, you know, like something in the intro that could be cool on this. That's why I was a little bit sour. My uh, strings were a little out. But, you know, if, if there were no steel player, if it was just electric, acoustic, keys, bass, and drums, I would do something in the baritone-ish world, maybe even grab an, grab an actual baritone, and then something in the slide-ish world, you know. But, yeah, that, that's my advice. More lyric, tighten up some of the length of the sections. Um, and even in, your, even in the right hand of your acoustic pattern, Get, get something happening that's melodic, you know, especially in the turnaround and in the solo section. Something, you know, the lyric disappears and there's nowhere for the listener's focus to shift to. It's just background strumming, right? So something in that pattern, you can find something in the pattern that, that has a shape to it that happens across the four bars of the turnaround and then across the eight bars of the outro. And then instead of that solo, man, I'm telling you, a bridge with some new lyric would be really cool. I hope you're able to apply all this to other songs you've written. You know, you say you, say you have a ton of them. I think, I think getting some work tapes down of, like I said, your three or four songs that you feel the most strongly about and um, getting in the studio with a, with a band and getting some demos and use those as a business card, as a, a way to get co-writes or a way to share your songs with artists, you know. I hope this was helpful. I'll see you guys later.